Thank you for coming in. Good to it's, be here. Uh, it's good to see you. We, um, just a little history. Mm -hmm. We met through John five, almost, I was, I mean, it's like four years ago. It's been a while. Yeah, yeah. And, um, at least. Yeah, John, John said, you guys gotta meet Dave. Dave has a company, Mercy. Mm -hmm. And he's just, just creative, really interesting guy and so let's just meet and let's just see what happens um, and I don't know if I I've, if we've ever done this but I don't know if I've ever given I feel like we've kind of just taken credit for the whole delivery the jug delivery thing we're like yay we're sitting around at a meeting and um, but we were sitting around with you yeah. and we we had already conceptualized the jugs mm -hmm. we're talking about the jugs and you just out of nowhere, it's like, what about just delivering these things to people's offices? And I mean, it turned, <laughs> in, it turned into this like huge thing for us, and it was I'm just so, glad. Um, so that was our introduction to Dave Shore. And, and you know, and I think we'd met a couple times after that, and we kind of picked your brain about, uh, you know, um, like an entrepreneurial attorney and all yeah, like yeah, I, yeah. we sat at 14th Street. It was like right after we had opened 14th Street. We hadn't seen yeah, that. I remember that. I remember that. Yeah. Um, and so uh, yeah, we've I mean we've we've completely evolved and things have been just getting you know. But but how it's how like how did the drugs go? What, what have you guys? Oh, we're still delivering. Still doing the yeah. yeah. Cool. It's every six months out of the year, uh, we got a guy who jumps on a bike and delivers yeah. it. Yeah, different bike bike than we were yeah, using. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's been it's been great. It's a, a lot more I think for marketing and branding. Yeah. You guys are four, four shops now. So we have four shops. We're building. Yeah. Our, we're building a roast house in Long yeah. Island City. Um, so that it? should be on. Thank you. That wow. should be online at the end of January. I think yeah. we'll have both roasters in. We got the first one in. We're waiting for the second one, and we're just in the process of building it. But um, it's been, you know, it's it's just. And you're you're an entrepreneur, and yeah. you are. I feel like every time we chat, it's just like it's just always it. something. Yeah, there's always something yeah, yeah. that works. Kinetic energy. Um, yeah. The, my favorite thing about entrepreneurship is kinetic energy. Yeah. So, and you're definitely someone that I would, I mean, yeah. hold in very high regard. Just as far as as far as that. Well, likewise. Thank like you. Um, I think you so, guys have been amazing. Yeah. You know, thank you. So, so, what, what prompted you to not stay in the box? Just to kind of like start thinking outside the box. Like when were you like I'm. Probably not going to have an ordinary job. I first, I first started, it was 2003 actually when I first started thinking that. Okay. So uh, the thing about Mercy that people don't realize, we, we didn't hit the market in 2011, but the concept uh, we incorporated in 2003. Wow. Um, and it was just kind of a little bit of, I don't want to, it's not, I guess the word hobby is wrong because it was a business, but it was really on our spare time, um, bootstrapping to the smallest degree, a little test run here, a little bit there, um, working. I was working probably 80 hours a week in my day job anyway. What were you doing? Um, it was a, a process re-engineering and, and improvement in business intelligence. Um, oh, um, so uh, <laughs> think about like the idea of like uh, uh, two things. Uh, um, uh, looking at a business uh, and, and how it, the processes are, how the, the technologies are, and how do you improve that for greater efficiencies. Okay. And then business intelligence is around surrounding data. So how do you take data um, and convert that data into something actionable okay. and actually uh, and look at the best way to display it and, and talk about it. Okay. And so I did that for a while, um, too long unfortunately, uh, but it was my own, it was a comfortable, it was very interesting at first, um, and actually I still find it to be a fascinating, I find data to be fascinating in general. Uh, oddly enough, data reporting all that kind of stuff, business intelligence is exciting, I just, I wanted to get off the ground and start my own thing, Okay. and I took two, I took about from 2003 to about 2010 before I actually uh, uh, went out and said I'm quitting my job, I'm going to um, take this out full time, I'm going to raise the capital I need and really build the business. Um, and it just took me a combination of getting the confidence I needed okay. to do it um, yeah. and I wanted to make sure I had enough money uh, tucked away 
that um, should anything happen, um, I have enough to last me throughout uh, the life. And then I just took the leap. Yeah. Um, and literally, I think we, we raised our first capital, uh, let's say, one to two months after I, I left my uh, day job. And did you find that once you, like, once you opened yourself up, and left your job, there was just like this huge band, like just everything opened up and it became a lot easier for you to raise capital? Um, Be because you had kind of free, I mean, because I, I would imagine if you're stuck in a job where you, you, you know you don't want to be there and you know you're trying to move on to the next thing, and once you kind of let go of that, it just opens up this huge world of opportunity and things just start to fall into, it just start to fall into place. Well, it, it's, um, it was three things. It was, okay. it was the... Um, a was the time it allowed. Um, it just at that point it was kind of having the day job took away time where you can't pitch and can't go out there and, and do your thing and, and spend it on the business. But B, it's that okay, your safety net's gone. Right. And so it's that without that safety net, you have to jump in action. Sure. But C, there's something very important to consider when, when starting a business. Um, anybody's going to invest in you or, or want to get involved with your business, and, and they want to see that the people that are, are driving that business are 100% committed. And nobody will put um, their, their money or their in their time or whatever behind something where you're not fully engaged and fully committed right. behind it. Um, and I was very even after raising capital um, for a long time after that I took no money, no salary. Right. Um, I know all about. And that. I spent. Yeah, exactly. It was either you got to take care of everybody beforehand and, and yeah. set the example, um, and then they'll. Uh, it's it's uh, rewarding that trust in you with the proper. Uh, I guess uh, the behavior, but the integrity behind it. Yeah. So. One, one of the big questions we got was, how much money do you have in it? Uh, how much do I? Per well, no. I mean, when oh. when we were when we were looking oh, yeah. to raise money, yeah. People, the first thing that they would say is, yes. how much have you put in? Yes. You know, I, I'm not going to just give you money, yeah. so that you can throw my money around. That's a very fair. I, and, I got that too. Um, yeah, yeah, I think that was that was a big question we got, and. And um, I had I, we had money in it, yeah. Which uh, so it was it was easy for us to answer, yeah. Um, but I think that also spoke to that obviously they have to trust you for sure. Um, yeah. But that brings that trust, it does. I think, to another level where it's like, all right, yeah. they're they have their own skin of the game, so I'm I'm more likely to give them money because if they waste mine, they're also wasting theirs, and I don't think they want yes. to waste their own. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. The more they feel you have the skin in the game and you're committed, right. the more somebody is going to get behind you as well. And vice versa, in the sense of too, is when you bring on an advisory board or, or individuals that are uh, engaged in the company in whatever way, you really want them to invest in the company too. Right. Um, you really want them to have skin in the game. You want us all to be uh, impacted by the business. Yeah. And the more that everybody involved is impacted, uh, the more everybody's going to put their all into it. Yeah. Uh, and they're really going to, they're not going to let it fall through. Um, so you spoke to, you know, between 2003 and 2010, and that's from, oh, yeah. and that's a long, and you said there was, there was the fundraising and there was also the confidence building. Which, which do you find was, like, more, more difficult for you? Was it raising the money or was it actually building the confidence knowing that this is something that I can actually accomplish? It was, it was a combination. I mean, raising the money, we didn't really start raising money in earnest until maybe six months to eight months before um, I left my job. Okay. And that just became, it proved maybe, maybe 10, 12, I'm not sure the exact amount, but um, it just proved difficult to do it on the weekends and the evenings and part time and so on. Right. And that definitely, um, but it wasn't, I'm not sure if that was, I'd say the, the, if I'm thinking what's more difficult, that was difficult because we were learning and we didn't know how to, I mean, this was my first company. Um, the people I had involved had not uh, started a company before. Uh, and it was kind of a, a huge learning experience right. and how to do that. Um, I think confidence was a big driving factor. Yeah. I think to get me out and to go and do it without that safety net right. um, forced me to, to, to gain that. Yeah. Uh, I guess is how I'd, I'm not sure if that answers the, Yeah, no, no, no for yeah. sure. And I, you know, we were, I feel like the last four years I've been pretending that I know what I'm doing until like a year ago where it's uh -huh. like, Finally, it's like, uh, I you think know. I actually kind of know what I'm what I'm yeah. talking about. But you're always um, learning. Always. I mean, consistently. For sure. Yeah. But I feel as though when, you know when I would sit with people and talk to people about starting a business, um, I feel like half the time I was just kind of 
kind of making stuff, up, <laughs> making it up as I went along. But um, yeah, no, I, I'm always learning. I'm sure it's like yeah. if you're not, then you know, yeah, you're yeah. You're, st you're stagnant. It's just not. It's um, so. Uh, 2010, you raise your money, yeah, yeah. and what after? Like, what? What next? And, and like, what was what was the design process? I mean, there's a very distinct design to Mercy, and um, we, we've had different designs throughout. Okay. And so, what we had when we first started raising capital, we first before we launched, was very different than what we ended up with. We had done um, the angel stayed the same throughout, um, and we had a wonderful. The girls that. Uh, the the angel on the on the on the oh on the uh, um, on the on, on the, the can, can. yeah uh, it was um, I mean there have been changes to it but the general uh, design of it yeah. we had a fantastic designer that put it together uh, early on and then oh uh, thank you but the actual can design and the design of the the um, assets and the graphics and everything around that um, evolved constantly throughout and we brought on a, a professional design firm right a uh, fantastic design firm uh, Moxie. And they um, they created a wonderful can. They actually, I believe, they won an award for the, their design of it. Uh, of, of yeah, awesome. I believe that they actually won. They won an award on that. They did a fantastic job, and that uh, that became the, the brand as it is. Yeah. And when I mean, this was because I I know my answer with I always loved doing what I was doing, but yeah. I wasn't having fun in the beginning. Yeah. Because I I felt like I was really I was wound really tight. And if things weren't going the way that I needed them to go, mm -hmm. they weren't going correctly. Mm -hmm. I know um, what that's like. And <laughs> it, it, I think it really prevented me from enjoying myself. Mm -hmm. I was I was happy, and I got up every morning. I was like, you know, I'm I'm, cool, I'm excited to go sure, to work. Sure. But there were times where I just wasn't happy. Did you did you have that experience? It was an emotional. It still is. In yeah. Tarps. tarps are an emotional roller coaster. Yeah. Um, and there's no other way around it. You have to to be uh, mentally and emotionally prepared to go through all of that before going into it. Um, it's the most exciting and, and, uh, thing in the world. It's the most um, fun, but yeah. it's also the most depressing and the most um, scary um, and exhilarating and cre creative. Um, the process of discovery, of growth. And there's all the positive and negative adjectives that can come up. I mean, right. yeah, and you don't know, one day it could be um, going incredibly well, and the next day you find out some news that's not so well, and how do you react to that? And uh, it's stressful. Um, it's stressful having when you have that on your shoulders, and, and especially when you're running the company uh, or when you you, find, when you start the company. Um, there's a lot that's on uh, your shoulders, and you have to be prepared to kind of um, handle the stress. And uh, it, it's not easy, yeah. and it never will be, and no matter. How many times have you gone through it? Um, I don't think it'll ever be uh, actually easy. Right. Um, it's gotten much more. I I've learned um, over the years how to best uh, handle different situations, how to become a better leader, um, how to manage my own uh, thought process better, uh, and I'll continue to grow on it yeah. and evolve. Uh, and so that's all I can ask uh, myself to do. For sure. And has that. Do you find that that's helped you make just in your personal life just more better decisions? And, I do. Uh, which, yeah. I do absolutely. <coughs> absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so what? <coughs> what would you? No, it's okay. Um, what would you for someone who's just you know has this idea? Sure. And thinks it's because everybody you know everyone has ideas yeah, yeah, yeah. and they always say it's like if you have an idea probably ten other people have that same idea and it's it's, a, it's like a it's just it's a race whoever yeah, yeah. brings it to to market first um, so someone has an idea and they what are what would you say the first steps are to at least to just feel like someone is putting the, the ball in motion and pressure test the idea look at the market research Okay. Um, it, I've seen people uh, come up with this fantastic idea that somebody else came up with three weeks before or right. two years, um, and they do maybe a, an hour of Googling and that's it. Right. And then suddenly go forward full steam ahead and realize that there's there's this and that in the market. Yeah. Um, it's understanding uh, where's your where's the white space. Right. Where, where can you enter into the market? Um, where um, and, and basically understanding. Your demographic, understanding um, your competitors, uh, understanding 
what the the overall space that you're going into is uh, fully before you even take that first uh, step. Just spend time on research. And so, how would how would one do that? Aside from just sitting in front of a computer and googling, what like what are some call people, okay. um, get a hold, uh, and okay, that sounds easier. You know what? I, I simplified that too much. <laughs> yeah. Because now it's now it's something I know how. Okay, let me go back a second and figure out how yeah. because. Originally with Mercy, one of the biggest problems too in figuring this stuff out was I didn't have the network back in 2003 that I had in 2010 yeah. where I could reach out to people um, that had had the experience. Uh, but what I would say to try and do is A, uh, as much as you can, look at your own network and see, even if it's just a matter, either it's your personal friends or even if it's a matter of going to LinkedIn and saying, okay. who's your second and third degree connection to this person? And then going to your friend and saying, hey, um, can you introduce me to this person? I just have a few questions to ask. Right. Just an informational interview. Uh, try not to either it's somebody industry related, it's somebody related to a position you're type of. Whatever you can do to gain that knowledge, um, is that's what I would say to kind of go with that. Yeah. Try and, and meet people and talk to people. You should always be, you should be meeting people nonstop. And there are meetup events, there are different things there, and you're going to go to five of them and four of them won't be worth anything. Right. But that fifth one yeah. will get you something, uh, and it could be the smallest little, uh, most interesting thing. However, that one small thing then can evolve. Uh, I can think of so many different scenarios uh, um, where uh, just night in, night out, going out to events uh, um, to meet people in my industry or, or uh, in, uh, even before, when I, before I started, um, within, just within business in general and how that kind of helped me move to the next step, next level. Yeah. It's all like kind of, everything's another launching pad to the next thing. Right. So I'd say that kind of the best thing that I, I learned with it is it can be very daunting when you, when you look at this enormous sky high goal. Right. Like, oh, I have to get here. Um, and then you're grasping for this, but if you're breaking everything down into small goals, right. um, and then it's kind of like leaping from one pad to the next, to the next, to the next, yeah. uh, and that, that's a progression and it makes it more achievable and more realistic in your mind. Yeah. And then when you're doing that too, and when you're, you're talking about it to whether it's somebody you want to bring on board or whether it's an investor or whether it's uh, somebody in the industry or whatever it is, you're, if you've piece of, broken it apart yourself into these goals, you're then much easier able to explain where you're headed right. and what the actual plan is and lay the plan out. Um, and I think that's, I mean, that's some of the best advice that I think anybody, that anybody can receive. I, I was talking to somebody and she had this really great idea for this dog, this dog product. And she kept going back to, I'm, I'm not a business person, I'm not a business person. I, I don't know how I can turn this, I don't know how I can bring this to market. And she, she was thinking like this huge end result. And I said, just make a few prototypes. You know, just like, just start, start super, like start, so start super simple. Yeah. Instead of thinking, oh, well, who's going to, Who's going to use this, and and how am I going to get this promoted? It's like you don't you don't have anything. Like at least see if it's something that that works, and and it's just don't think big picture. Think okay, I need to get my LLC set up, so I'm just going to go ahead and, and for me it was always as long as I can have something tangible, mm -hmm. that's how I worked the best. Yeah. And so I would sit, you know, there were times where I would sit in front of the computer and, and you know, go on, look on maps and just try to plot things sure. on maps, but sure. it was so much easier and I felt like I was getting so much more done when I actually went out, walked like block by block by block and, and just literally physically mapped out yeah. everything because I was, I felt like I was doing something. Because a lot of times, and it's yeah. just like you said, it's like, you can't just sit and Google something for an hour. Yeah. It's like you have to, you have to put yourself out there and go and, and be uncomfortable. Yeah. And I think yeah. that's that's always and we we try to push people all the time. It's make yourself like think outside, put yourself outside of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. Be a little bit uncomfortable because that's like that's where the magic happens. It's when you're always doing that. Yeah. 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 I absolutely agree. And um, almost almost too. Uh, it's almost a combination of you have that. And at the same time, knowing the the um, breadth of the market itself, so it's it's the combination of the research and the get out of your yeah get out yeah. of your body uh, get out of your comfort mm -hmm. zone and go do. So, uh, what's next for Dave Short? <laughs> I'm starting this new company. Okay. Actually, I literally just started it. 
uh, I'd say a little over one month ago. Okay. Uh, it's called a wearable apparel. Okay. Uh, what we're doing is we're specifically our first product is focused on child safety. Okay. Uh, Which is a, it's an important one. It's it's huge. We think. Yeah. I mean, and we're looking at it from the sense of. Uh, how do you turn some? Uh, it's a wearable, uh, and I'll, actually, let me tell you uh, first what the product is, and I'll tell you a bit more about it. Okay. And it's very uh, most basic. It's um, think about a, a bracelet or a band on a child, okay. uh, and a parent. You know, a keychain fob uh, or, or a car. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Like a, uh, uh, you know the. Uh, so you have the the bracelet on the child. Okay. Um, the child walks out in that uh, whatever direction. You set the range, be it earshot or eye shot or whatever. It's right. gonna, the child walks past that range. On your fob, you have an alert or a, uh, a buzzing. Okay. And then as soon as that alert and buzzing comes out, uh, you press the button on it. It tells you the exact direction of the child and the exact number of feet they're going to be or, or the close to exact number of, uh, of feet away the child is going to uh, be. And so you're actually able to look at uh, What we're doing, though, the, the key thing is we're looking at this kind of like, and we're working on, we're a month old, so we're, this is still a work in progress. Sure. But we're looking at things from the perspective of a tool, not a toy. Uh, or like looking at the idea of how do you uh, do things for your, your everyday um, parent, not really looking towards gadgets for more for early adopters, the technology and how um, complicated more, how can you make it more simple? How can you make it out of the box? How can you make something that is going to give a parent peace of mind where they don't have to worry that they have it on or the child has it on unless there's a problem. Okay. And that's kind of the way we're, we're looking at, uh, at building it out. We're also looking at where we find a huge space is uh, the outdoor market. Right. And so you've got so many families, I think half of the Americans uh, are at some point within six or I forget how many months, but are camping or hiking or outdoors yeah. and so And you have a consistent concern of a lost child. You have a, and I, I think the exact number is about one in a hundred children uh, will end up go missing at some point. Um, and missing not That's in the sense of crazy not statistic. in the sense of abducted missing, sure, but like lost as yeah. in like I lost for whatever the period yeah. of time or in the or mall. Something. Yeah, exactly. All exactly. of a sudden on the PA system. Yes, yes, right. Yes. But not to be confused with abducted right, right, right. Um, by any means. Uh, but when you're camping and when you're in the woods or when you're hiking, yeah, and say a child gets lost and you're looking for the child and the child's looking for you and it's this round right, right, about right. thing. And then you have no cell phone reception in a lot of uh, um, uh, areas uh, or the inability to use it. Most state parks don't even allow it. Uh, how do you then, how do you locate that child? What's a good tool, a good solution for that? And so we're looking at this as a way to, to be able to, both in your everyday playing, so allowing a child to go get a Bruce Lee and to go out and play and to, right. to be able to engage and be curious without having a parent have to worry about hovering over the child constantly um, and without without having to restrain your child. Okay. Um, so it's a combination of those uh, those two. Because I, what I was going to say and um, what I was going to ask you is do you think that would make parents a little bit more like relaxed and laid back that their kid is that they know exactly. and I think that's the point it's the point it's about peace of mind right it's about the, the parent not having to worry that they're going to turn their back and their kid's going to be gone they're not going to be at, at Times Square or in the mall at a sporting event and suddenly uh, turn around and lose their child or conversely uh, outdoor in middle America different places outdoor playing um, right. allowing the kid to wander in the backyard or, or, or further out uh, to uh, just to be a kid, allowing the kid to be a kid without right. having to um, tether the parent, without sure. tracking or targeting, but really kind of just allowing that uh, that leeway in that distance. I think there might even. I mean, I don't have I don't have any kids. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, and there might be some retraining, and I think parent maybe for parents, where mm -hmm. it's like. I, I would imagine, like especially when someone has their first child, it's it's very very difficult for them be. to, yeah. but but to let kind of yeah. and let the kid kind of be. Yeah. Um, so it's really interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you do you have kids? I don't. I don't. You don't have any kids. I have a lot of friends that do. Uh, okay. I, I, I just I don't myself. Yeah. 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 Um, Paul. Paul has, yeah. my business partner has, he's got three kids. Yeah. Uh, he's got a nine month old, three and change, three and a half year old, and then a 16 year old. Yeah. Um, and 
Yeah, it's it's really really interesting, and that's that's kind of just the start. So. I mean, that's the start. We're going. I mean, the idea of child safety has been the first. The, the company itself is based on a safety, security, and connection through wearable technology. Okay. So you've got the child safety. You start with. You move on. You have other products you can build towards. A, um, there's a B2B version of it. Uh, a group uh, uh, monitoring uh, where you have, say, a school group or a, a, a Boy Scouts of America, Girl Scouts of America group. Um, so oh, well, you have. 20, 30, 40, 50 kids, okay. and you're, you're trying to, you have a caregiver trying to keep track of those children. Right. Uh, say you're at a campsite and they rent one out, you sell to the campsite however many bracelets plus the group one, and they rent one out consistently to families as they're uh, um, staying for the week or staying for, for the night. You then can move to an adult version where you're, you're hiking and you're in the outdoors, uh, uh, your, your friend is climbing and you're over there. And unfortunately, something happens, and so on. And you're able to immediately know that and really find your friend. Okay. Um, you can move on to pets. You can you can build out that technology a lot. Uh, and then from there, you go into. You can, there are so many different. I'm not to get into any more detail on, on yeah. the, the broader picture, but within safety in general, as a, as a place with wearable technology, hasn't really been touched. Uh, there are a few things here and there, uh, but. Uh, people focus, their, the focus tends to be on health and fitness and Internet of Things and, and the appliance uh, right. uh, side of it. And so we want to try and uh, do something uh, specifically surrounding those things. Safety, security, connection. Yeah, and sleep for sure. Oh, sleep, there's a ton of... Uh, I'm excited to get the Up3, the uh, new uh, um, job mode. Um, I, I haven't had one yet uh, on sleep. Uh, they're doing some fantastic things. Yeah, I don't... I, do you, how, do you sleep well at night? Do you, I don't. You don't? Unfortunately, no. Okay. It's difficult for me. Um, how Do you sleep on your back? Do you sleep on your side? I sleep on um, usually my side. Okay. But I first, I'm on my back, and then I'm on my side just trying to right. sleep. I have recently started taking melatonin and time-release melatonin. Okay. Um, has that been helping? It has. It has. It's important to take, uh, the microgram dosage is important. So um, the standard thing you'll see in a, um, in a any, uh, um, a package or, or, or a chart of pills is like three milligrams or five milligrams. Really, what you should be taking is 300 micrograms or, or 600 micrograms. So okay. it's such a larger dose that's been added out there that is given than what your body really needs. Okay. Um, and that's something that people aren't necessarily aware of. Yeah. I, I, like, whenever someone asks, I always have to think about how I, and it's always like I have my head, my hand under, yeah. my arm under my pillow, and I have two. I have a 55 pound dog and a 45 pound dog. Oh my god. <laughs> and so I feel like I share my bed with yeah. with the two of them. Um, and I'll wake up in the middle of the night and I'll be like all not how I started sleeping. And the two of them are just like comfortable right in the middle of the bed. Yeah. Um, but um, I never, I can't sleep on my back. It's my chiropractor. Own, yeah. My chiropractor said, he said, he said, do you sleep on your back? I said, no. He goes, yeah. You, you, I mean, he said I could tell you to try, but he's like, I can't sleep on my back. But it's it's, it's how you're supposed yeah, to it's sleep. sleep. Yeah, it's hard to do. I, Whatever uh, you do, don't sleep on your stomach. That's the worst. Well, see, I I think I do with. I don't oh, know if I. Yeah, that, that's the dangerous. <laughs> that's the worst. Uh, you put a okay. camera and film yourself at the night and see how you, uh, uh -huh. how you sleep. Yeah, because that actually puts the worst kind of pressure on your back. I've had two back surgeries, uh, so I'm. Okay. Yeah, very careful about uh, stuff and and yeah, front side sleeping is not. Uh, it's not the healthiest. Okay. I used to do that though. I totally. Yeah, sleep is a such a tough one. It's a tough one. Do you get up? Do you get up early in the morning or? Depends. What, what's your day look like usually? Um, how oh, so it varies. Okay. It varies immensely. I'd say usually get up around eight. Um, if I get out of bed at eight, I'll get up and I'll go. Um, I'll go work out for a bit. I'll meditate uh, and kind of get started. If I haven't slept well, I'll stay in bed for the next 45 minutes, okay. trying to, to do whatever. Um, I'll then, um, I shower very quickly, we get together quickly. I'll then make a phone call, um, check my emails, uh, probably get one or two calls done in the morning. Yeah. Um, arrive at the office around 10, uh, end up uh, there, have, try and have a lunch in between. I try and, what I want to do as much as possible is at least be out meeting or talking to somebody. Uh, at some point during the day rather than just staying in the office. Right. Uh, um, then I'd say probably out by nine. And it's strange as it sounds, and I, my, my um, head of marketing uh, and the, the guy who ran marketing for me 
the guy at Mercy, who's the, the last uh, um, uh, marketing that I worked with, uh, ultimately came on with me to this new company, mm -hmm. and we're building this with a wearable. And when we were just working on some uh, documents over the past week, and I'll tell you between 6 and 9 p.m. 6 and 9 p.m., okay. Yeah. For some reason, the two of us go on, on this creative rampage at between 6 and 9, and it's fantastic. It's almost like within those three hours, yeah. we get more done than we did um, in the time prior to that. Um, no one's bothering you. It's I, I would imagine. Like, 6 o'clock, so already people are like done. To, yeah, that, that's helpful, actually. There, there yeah. are no interruptions, yeah. and it's kind of the end of the day. But it's just, it's, there's something about a synergistic back and forth um, at that, I don't know, it's how the mind works. I remember back with Mercy, uh, I would have these nights where I'd be working from like 10 p.m. to 1. Um, and I'd be home, but I'd be in my bed. And that would be when i do my best writing. Right. Um, and, and it'd be my creative peak. And so it's, and I, I guess it's different for everyone where they have these uh, different times. And it has to do, I'm sure, uh, with your metabolism, your biorhythms. I, I don't know enough about it. Um, but I've, I've spoke to different people and they have different times in which they're creative. And I think it's really important, uh, at least the way I look at it is, I try, instead of trying to retrain that for myself, I tried to retrain it. Um, I wasn't necessarily successful. What I try to do now is that when I feel like I'm having a creative pe uh, period, yeah. I try and harness it yeah. and go with it during embrace this time. It. And embrace yeah. it, exactly. Yeah. And if it happens to be an inconvenient time, so what? Right. Take it, go with it, yeah. and um, to see where it leads. Yeah. And that's, yeah, one of the most uh, interesting lessons I've learned. Um, yeah, they always say it's like, first thing in the morning is always, you know, good, like between 5 a.m. and like 8, 7 a.m., that's when your brain is most, but I feel like it's just very different, you it, know? It really Everybody's is. different. Yeah, yeah, um, everybody has a, yeah, everybody's a different, different way of looking at it. Well, that's great, 6 to 9 p.m. My, yeah, my, my two dogs, they get me up at 6 a.m., so I'm up at 6 a.m. Really? every day. Yeah. And then it's, it depends. It depends on where my head's at as to whether or not I like get back into bed. Uh, fair enough. But I, I was reading something recently, and it said it was talking about like how many times people hit the snooze button. It's just like snooze, snooze, snooze. And I know it's a bad. What it. what it's what the you know I think it was yeah. some comedian who said this. Getting up in the morning is is, is difficult as it is. Why would you want to do it? Like multiple, I love multiple that. times. Why would you want to get it's up so true. in the morning like four times? Because it's, so it's like you get, you're like up. And I yeah. get up at six. I take the dogs out for a walk, yeah. and then I'll get back. I'll suddenly like get back into bed and be like, okay, I just need another half hour. But it's like it's such a pain to get up. It's a, so why do I want to do it again? It's I don't want to do it again. Habit. Yeah. I, I actually got to recommend something for sleep. By the way, are you a laptop person in bed? No. Okay, I'm not. I'm mean, sorry. I am. I am. Okay. And I've tried not to be. Yeah. Um, and I haven't successfully gotten there, okay. but I found a very good inter intermediary step that actually works. Okay. Um, and this is the, actually my head of technology for the wearable uh, company uh, gave me this tip. I think it's called Flux, but there's this program that changes the blue light uh, and, get, and, and over the time throughout, say 6 p.m. it lowers it a little bit, 8 p.m. a little more, and then by the time if you're looking at night, there's no more blue light on your screen. Huh. It's all, um, I, don't, I forget what the name of the, it is when it's not blue light, but uh, it eliminates that, blue, uh, that, uh, that spectrum of light. Yeah. And so it's not hindering your melatonin production or keeping you awake. Um, and then... In to, the screen? In the screen, okay. yeah. Yeah, and so I've been trying that, and I can't tell whether it's out of the melatonin, but I... Okay. Uh, recently I have been, the past week has been a good, better sleep. Go with it. Yeah. And she'll just go with it. Don't question that, it. That, that as well. And you know, I also hear, and I keep, I don't meditate as much as I should. Okay. Um, and I need to get back into a, like a real regular practice because yeah. that helps with sleep immensely. Oh, for sure. And it's being able to, uh, at will, um, relax the mind and kind yeah. of pull back from, it's very easy to, at night um, or at any point in time, think about, I have to get this done, this done, this done, this done. Yeah. Uh, and it's just the un most unhealthy thing in the world you can do. Oh, it just, it, it'll never stop. It just never stops. Yeah. The more you can kind of focus your, your breathing and kind of, Focus your mind away from your those, that thought process and more into your body. Yeah. Um, just easier things become uh, in general. And I love doing it. Uh, I'm excited to, uh, I guess, to go back to a wearable for a second. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's it's interesting starting. It's we were talking about the emotions of starting a company again. Yeah. And, and and it's really incredibly exciting to be building something. And I had a very uh, there's a piece of advice I want to give. Okay. Uh, because lessons learned throughout Mercy 
and throughout my experiences, even over the past, not just the past four years, but the past since so three, kind of help help me guide how I'm going to start and structure this. Yeah. Um, and one of those lessons is, is how you hire and how you build a corporate culture. Okay. Uh, and it's crucial. It, it is. It is how you hire and how you build that corporate culture. In my mind, is probably one of these, if not the single, one of the most important things you can do in starting a company. Mm -hmm. um, and at the stage following the, obviously we talked about the ideation and, and how you you're going and you're talking to people and doing research and understanding it and building that prototype or so on. But the next stage is then okay, you're going to get incorporated or you're going to get whichever you're hiring your your corporate attorney. Um, you want to do that for you really want to do that early on, so you don't make any mistakes on uh, on how you structure and set things up, uh, and so you're you're really kind of set on that way. Uh, it's a it's a small thing to do, but it's a very important early stage. But then the next thing, the single most important, when you hire, don't focus just on resume. Uh, it's it's an easy mistake people make. Uh, people look at a resume and say, oh, this is uh, perfect for the position. Um, right. Where this person has twice the amount of experience as this person, so I'm automatically going with this uh, this person. Or they're trying to shoehorn into this or this or this. Passion. When you're starting up a company, you're going to be working long hours. You got to be working something you believe in. Yeah. And you got to believe fully. And everybody around you has to believe fully. It cannot be just a paycheck. It cannot be the idea of, of just money. Right. It's got to be about a desire, a drive, a belief in what you're doing. And so the people you hire, I say passion over paper. Yeah. And so of course the skill sets have to match. Right. I mean, obviously. Um, but I would take that passionate individual, that driven individual, any day over a more experienced person. Because uh, that's the person that will be there for you. And when I say you, I mean the company. Because yeah. at any point in time, I will give it their all. Yeah. And it means the world. It means absolutely the world. Yeah. And I feel like with our company now, I cannot speak more highly enough. Uh, we're, there are four of us only. Mm. We're, we're a small company just starting up again. Um, couldn't be happier with the people I have on board. Yeah. And, uh, and who, everything they contribute and who they are. So. Yeah, we, when we hire, I mean, it's, it's not easy. You know, uh, we have, there's like six, 70, maybe we have 70 employees, something yeah. like that. And you know, we always say when you're when you're looking at a resume, it's so much. We we can train people how to make coffee. Yeah. We can train coffee. Yeah. What we cannot train is people to be personable and people to smile and yeah. people to make you feel yeah. welcome. We can't train that. Yeah. You have that or you don't have that. It's exactly. And so, um, I I mean I couldn't agree with you more. And yeah. obviously there's it's very hard to find people as driven as you. Yeah. Um, yeah. And who take things as seriously as, as you do, because probably no one really will, you know, aside from you and, and you know, whoever you're founding the company. You're founding, yeah, your core founding, yeah. Um, but you want to try to get people who have, have as close to that passion as, as you do. And, yeah. and, you know, a lot of times it's, there's, they don't have that priority, but, you know, you can, but it's, I mean, hiring and the culture and, and just Everything. finding that passion is so much more important than what their resume looks like. I, am, I mean, I'm, uh, it's, I'm fully it's, Yeah, and the, the ethos too. Yeah. And the, the ethos, who are those individuals? Right. Um, looking at just as much, uh, do they have integrity? Right. Um, are they, I mean, what's their, if you want to create a, a, um, uh, a culture of giving back, uh, for example, then the people you hire, mm. that needs to be within their, their DNA. Uh, so that's enormous, and that I couldn't even I couldn't think of a better lesson than that yeah. uh, all throughout. Um, well, awesome. So uh, thank you so much for all of cool. all of that, and let's uh, let's just get down to uh, uh, the five uh, the five Spitfire. <laughs> okay. Um, just don't think about it. All right. First thing that comes to mind. All right, ready? That's tough. Favorite mode of transportation. Train, subway. Okay. Are you a good listener? Yes. Okay. Um, well, I guess this, I mean, uh, this is, how many pillows do you sleep with? Three. Three, okay. What's your favorite word? Favorite word. Favorite word. Brilliant. Okay. And your favorite elementary school subject? Ooh. I have to say history. History? Can we take that? 
Absolutely. We'll take it. All right. Awesome. Well, that's it. <laughs> I like those spitfire fire questions at the end. Those are awesome. Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. I love it. Uh, this is great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank oh, you. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. All right. Really great to see you. Yeah. Very cool. And catch up and hear what you're doing. Awesome. I'm excited to see this. Thank yeah, you. Very cool. Oh, thank you, guys.